Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion about an idea of finding freedom by going to live in the woods. I think everyone who has taken an interest in personal freedom has come across this idea or thought about it um, themselves at some point or another, and probably also come across it as, as a kind of insult if you've said critical things about society um, or the culture that you live in. Uh, you may well have heard, uh, heard the response that uh, if you don't like it here, you should go off and live in the woods. So this is a discussion about that idea as a way of finding personal freedom. And the discussion is based around um, the book Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And Thoreau was really the most famous proponent of this idea, uh, especially in this book, Walden. He went to live um, in the woods for two years in the 1850s um, on land owned by a friend of his, the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he wrote this book as a description of his time living in the woods and also um, as his idea of the virtues of a life of simplicity away from corrupt society. Personally, I did not like the book. I listened to it on audio and I found it quite a difficult uh, listen. I mean, it may well have been the particular narrator. It might be different if I try a different narrator, but it's a book that has a very uh, loose structure and has contains lots of different ideas. I didn't particularly like it, but as a vehicle to discuss this idea, um, I think it's a really interesting one for us to talk about um, because I think the idea itself has a much broader relevance for people who are talk- interested in uh, personal freedom. We also talk about another book, um, which is Into the Wild uh, by John Krakauer. And that, that book is about the life of a guy called Christopher McCandless, who decided to sort of live out this ideal of going to find freedom in in seclusion he went off to alaska and actually died in the wilderness and um, a movie has been made about his life um, directed by sean penn also called into the wild which i think is really worth worth seeing it, it gives a very interesting insight into the personal history behind somebody who chose to try and live out this idea and and the tragedy of what happened to him in the end So I hope you enjoy our discussion of Walden by Henry David Thoreau and of this idea of finding freedom by going off into the wilderness. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I I like the book. I I thought it was a lot of nonsense about it being a sort of big solution for society as a whole, but I do think that spending time away from complexity is good. I mean, I spent a year and a half working up north, gold panning, living in a tent, and, uh, you know, away from phones and televisions and radios, and there was nothing up there at all. And I think that was a good experience, and I think that's worthwhile. I just think he tried too hard to make it into some sort of philosophical principle when uh, it's, uh, you know, a vacation from complexity is a good thing, but I don't think that makes complexity a negative, if that makes any sense. Right, yeah, absolutely. So in other words... It can be a useful experience, but this is not like, well, why don't we all just go off and live like that? Yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, civilization is a good thing to disrespect until you get a toothache. There's always been that aspect of things for me. And, you know, if there's childbirth or all those kinds of things, uh, it, it's, it's one thing for, if I remember rightly, he was a single guy with no kids uh, who enjoyed the woods. And, of course, his society would have been a lot more primitive and superstitious in many ways than ours. So I can certainly understand that for him, it made a lot of sense and was a very valuable thing to do. But as you say, it wasn't himself. He wasn't sort of doing it himself. Uh, He was heavily subsidized, which I think is an important thing to talk about. You know, as you said, if you have a friend who's willing to put you up, you can be the Cato Caitlin of minimalism, but that doesn't make you a a rugged individualist. But um, I think he, like most people, he tends to find an experience that is valuable for him and then extrapolate it to a universal principle. I'm always sort of suspicious of that kind of thing, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we were just talking before you came on uh, that, uh, about the fact that the, the, uh, a difficulty that I have for this book is that it is like his own little anecdotes and little home, homespun sort of, well, it's, it's basically his conclusion about the things that have worked for him and the things that haven't. And some of them are great um, because he does 
sort of you know he he does have um a great independence of 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 spirit in many ways but what the thing that i really struggle with in this book is that it isn't an argument there isn't a series of principles leading to an argument it's it's just like oh here's here, here's what i think and there isn't you you kind of all of these little ideas are thrown uh, one after another as sort of little quotes um but it's kind of hard to follow because it doesn't really um it doesn't really flow as a principled argument about you know either steps to her per personal happiness by through you know stepping outside society or even a critique of of you know what he sees around him itself it's just it's it's just conclusions you know yeah it's something that i've noticed in a lot of buddhist or or speculative kind of quote philosophy which is it's the it's the frozen happiness argument and the frozen happiness argument is something like this you know there was a time when i was hiking up in alaska and uh, i came over a ridge and i saw these beautiful blue mountains and there were these clear blue azure lakes and there were ducks flying across the lakes dipping their wings in the little ripples and this everything was unearthly quiet and it was a beautiful and perfect moment and then people attempt to build a philosophy out of these beautiful and perfect moments as if happiness is not a moving target happiness for human beings is a moving target but there's such a desire in people to find this frozen happiness approach like if i could just find a way to have that moment forever then that would be happiness but that to me is a completely impossible goal it's just not that's not how happiness works happiness is a moving is a moving target but people want to freeze it and find some way to stay inside these frozen moments and be happy forever in this this state of transitory perfection and that to me is uh what it says is that happiness is not under my control uh, happiness is not about you know achieving and continuing to achieve excellence throughout your life it's about stepping inside a postcard of a single moment staying there forever in a state of perfect bliss but those moments would very quickly become prisons if you tried to stay there yeah absolutely that with that single point you know having climbed up the top of the mountain to see that amazing view come nighttime you're going to freeze <laughs> well yeah and i mean so how good's the view going to look if you just sit and stare at it for two weeks it's like ah, i've seen this before right i mean <laughs> uh, finding nemo was a great movie when i first saw it now that i'm seeing it for the 200th time with isabella i must say that i can find some flaws so you know <laughs> happiness wears out through repetition but that first moment of surprise and awe that happens with certain kinds of happiness uh that's the same mistake that people make about romantic love right you fall in love and there's there's months of just bliss and all of that and then finding a way to make it, make it more sustainable is a real challenge so i uh, i think that's that's one and it's, sorry it's been a while since i read the book but but that's the main problem that i had with the book was this idea that you've got this postcard of happiness and if you can crawl into that two dimensional space and live forever then you'll be perfectly happy i just it's not human beings will constantly adjust to happiness to have a new standard that's just the way life is and the interesting thing is that he does come back right i mean he only spent 2 years at walden so in a sense like I, i i haven't read the end of the book but in a sense he does treat it like you know a time away and then a time to come back um but but i don't think that the argument is sort of i don't think the book's it, like read like that i think the book's read as sort of an argument about or rather a, a sort of um a case for going off and living in the woods when it is a sort of extended holiday in a sense for him right and there is this also this feeling that ha happiness is somehow the opposite of wherever i am right so you remember the beatles in the 60s they went off for the maharaji uh, and they spent uh, i don't know months or i don't know how long and a lot of people did this in the 60s and the 70s they went off to india and they lived in these ashrams and they studied this kind of philosophy because happiness is just the opposite yeah hey who's that because happiness is the opposite of wherever you are which is a very sad depressing thing no No dad. No dad. Okay, keep going. I'll listen for a bit. <laughs> no dad. That's hilarious. Well, I I didn't really have any any anything else that I sort of could get from this because I as I said I found it um quite difficult to really follow and concentrate on but but um did you guys have any other thoughts about, you know, the whole like whether or not it's from from the row himself did you have any thoughts about going off and spending time away from complexity i mean is that something that you've done or that you want to do um it's something that i've done in in little bursts and i'm trying to make 
plans and align my life in a way that I can do a lot more of it. I think that, or just from the experiences that I've had just out in the middle of nowhere with some awesome people is, uh, fantastic. It's, it's, I think that, yeah, there is, uh, definitely, a, uh, something to be gained from it. Again, I'm not too, too clear exactly what that thing is, but, uh, I think s- some of it has to do with silence and that could just be like a personal thing for me because I've always lived in a city, but, um, just being somewhere where if nobody's talking, it's very, very quiet. It's very relaxing for me. Should we give you a few minutes of that now? (laughs) (laughs) That's that's all right. (laughs) Sometimes it's just plain awkward. You guys are just talking so much. It's like overwhelming. (laughs) Sensory overload. You need to get out into the woods to get away from this kind of Skype. Yeah, I was just going to say, Marissa, I think I know what you mean. And especially because, in a way, you do have to get desensitized to cope with city living. I mean, just in terms of like the sensory input, it's just noise and a, a massive amount of media and ideas and stuff that you are constantly being bombarded with that if you do get away from it for a while you get a chance to actually see the difference and to kind of resensitize yourself to your physical environment you know because i at least in london i find that i mean you do have to kind of slightly dissociate from your senses just to get through uh walking around the city all day long because otherwise it is kind of overwhelming i think that uh, it, it this desire for complexity for me or or lack of complexity has a lot to do with inner chaos. So. Yes, my love bug. Yes, my love. I'll get back to you. Yeah. And just to say something to, uh, what Steph said about, um, reflecting inner chaos. I think that that's, I think that that's quite, quite true. And, uh, I said something, or I meant to say something kind of like that a little bit earlier about how I, I think that he, uh, Thoreau in his book, puts a, a, too much emphasis on, uh, or like giving credit, too much credit for the environment, um, for his happiness and, and virtue. And, uh, like, I, I, well, probably about five days a week, I spend a half an hour just with my eyes closed. and trying to, you know, just silence my mind and achieve some, some kind of, um, you know, stimulus reduction. Uh, just, I, I've found that, that that kind of thing really helps me, um, just in general, slow down my thinking and <laughs> not react so quickly to, uh, yeah, to, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Cause if you can't basically, if you can't get away to, you know, Walden Pond, then you can do meditation or, you know, other, other, there are other ways of kind of re reconnecting with the, uh, with the space around you just without having to go off into the wilderness. And I, I totally get what you're saying about, he sees the, um, the, he sees the, uh, environment as the sort of the, uh, the point you were making earlier about that's the source of his peace and so forth. When actually, you know, could be more about the fact that he's got himself out of those destructive relationships that that uh, that can be there in in social life, and is you know kind of achieve some more inner peace because of that. I also think that at least I found that there's something quite sad about looking for that escape hatch from interaction. He, in, in, in some ways, of course, he's saying that hell is other people, because what he's really escaping is not the city, but, but people, which means I think he's unable to manage his relationships. That's something I've noticed from people. The people who all worked up north where I was all had terrible relationships. So it's almost like a confession of failure to me that you can't manage your relationships if you want to escape to that degree. Right. I think that's an excellent point. That is an yeah. excellent point. Yeah, absolutely. It's a coping mechanism um, when you don't see kind of, you know, getting your relationships good or getting them gone and finding better, uh, better relationships as a, as a, an option that you can comprehend. I guess. Yeah. But I can totally, um, imagine wanting to do it with someone else or with another group of people that you really enjoy spending time with, because it's a great opportunity to 
have long conversations and just you know get away from urban life for a bit but I couldn't imagine wanting to do it by myself for any more than a couple of days because I think I would go mad (laughs) (laughs) it's like that into the wild guy he could not exist or function in the world that was in the social world and um uh, I, there was another book I read, I can't remember, by another guy who went to go and live in Alaska with his son and his girlfriend, and his girlfriend just couldn't last. But he had all these terrible jobs uh, where he was very cynical and hostile towards, quote, you know, corporatism, and, and it seemed very ideological in a way to set yourself up as in such opposition to the world that is that you have to flee from it. To me, the, the big ingredient that's always missing is what happened in childhood that made that such an attractive option. Let's say even if it is an, object, an objective option, that's valuable, it's never portrayed that way. And I always feel that there's this big enigma around what has made a person that way. To me, it's a little bit more explained when you look at the history of these people before they, they flee the world, that uh, they had, uh, they looked upon their parents usually, from what I've read, as um, uh, hypocrites and manipulators. And I think that it's a, it's a, it's a defug on nuclear, so to speak. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about the Into the Wild one, I haven't read the book, but I have seen the movie. And I mean, his family situation was just so awful. I mean, it was just a horrible, horrible um, family with massive amounts of uh, lies and um, manipulation from the parents and stuff. So it was totally clear um, just from watching that, what, how that sort of... Uh, his choices related back to his childhood. I don't know what Thoreau's life was like, but I bet that there was similar things going on that he needed to escape, you know, and that he didn't, that couldn't see another way of doing it apart from going off into in the woods. And that, of course, I think accords with the experience of many people here that abuse as a child is not just your family, it's society as a whole that colludes and ignores it. And so in a sense, you kind of have to flee it if you don't process that aspect of it. You have to flee society in a sense because it's either abusers or enablers of abusers. So the whole thing looks pretty fetid. Yeah, and in a sense, I think a lot of people um, who started living their values have kind of done that in a way. I mean, I think there are very few people who are still in contact with their families and their whole circle of friends. So in a sense... Yeah, like, but the great thing is, rather than going to the woods... We don't have to go to the woods. Yeah, we don't have to go to the woods. You just you basically <laughs> just say, find, yeah. that, find a, a, a good group of people on the internet instead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I was kind of thinking about that in the context of like the parallels between what we've done and what Roe did. And it's kind of, there's a real sense of helplessness, I think who do end up doing that because what, going to the woods you mean yeah because it is in a sense like giving up almost yeah because it's basically leaving the good leaving the really dynamic bits of the world to all the evil people yeah it's like why should they have london i want london yeah <laughs> so i just want it with people that i love not with the People who who uh, I can't be myself with, and who yes, but he didn't have the web, right? I mean, if if we didn't have this, right, would it be a lot more understandable? Well, I know what you mean. I mean, that's definitely that's definitely true um, because um, the amazing thing about this is that, unfortunately, the the reality of it, it does seem to be that um, there are just you know one in a million people like thinking. Uh, to the point where they are looking for this kind of thing and they're scattered all over the planet. But so, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely have got it a lot easier, but then again, he's also, as far as I can see, I, I, I'm struggling to remember this. Maybe you guys remember, but he's, he's not down on uh, like, uh, he, he's a little bit of a anti communication and anti technology guy as well. Cause he, because he's so into the simple life and you could argue that even in his day and age, you could go and live in New York and other places where, I mean, you didn't have the web, but you had a lot more social choice. You, you had the opportunity to live independent of your family and to find your own way in a new social circle, a new circle of friends. It's not village life anymore. You already had the metropolis where he could have chosen his own social circle. Now, of course, he'd still have all of the crappy um, mysticism and... Um, uh, statism and all the other beliefs around him but 
I mean, you could at least, um, in the 19th century, you could already make your own life free of the, the relationships that, um, you know, that you didn't enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I feel like I, I can relate to uh, the desire to kind of just escape society and, and go live in the woods. I mean, that, that definitely does appeal to, to a part of me. Um, I don't, I don't think that it's any kind of like real solution. And, and I definitely don't think that it's the answer to happiness, but, but I, yeah, I mean, society is, it, it's not, uh, it's not a very pleasant place to be around in general. I mean, you can create, you can create your own environment that is, uh, that is a lot better. But there is, I mean, if you live in a city, it's almost inevitable that you're going to come across some pretty ugly stuff. Uh, I was just going to say, too, I think there's a lot of passive aggression uh, in going to go and live in the woods. Like, I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to go home, so to speak. Uh, I think that it is, a, um, it is an act of despair, so to speak, but it is also, to me, an act of passive aggression. Like, I'm just not going to participate, and that may be somewhat wise, but... Uh, like in the moment, but as I think as you say, Jake, it just turns the world over to the bad people. Right. And everything that we have, that we treasure, has come from people who didn't go and live in the woods. I yeah. mean, if Thoreau didn't do much to end slavery or, or bring equality to women. Uh, he basically just said, uh, you know, <laughs> run away. Uh, I, you know, I hate to put it that, that boldly, but that's a lot of what I got out of it. And not like run away uh, for a while to refresh, which makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. But that there's something of eternal value in in fleeing the, the combat to make the world a better place. Yeah, and in that sense, yeah, I think yeah, that's a great point. Sorry. I mean, it is a fight and it is a war. I mean, <laughs> there are the advanced psycho classes like us who are you know trying to build a world that is more consistent, and there are the more primitive and, and brutal ones who only use morality to control and, and destroy others. And uh, it's not. It, it's not a transition that can occur without conflict, at least not that I've ever seen. Yeah, because, you know, rationality gives us, you know, advanced sewage systems, which are great. Like, I'm really happy to be living in a city that has that, um, you know, as opposed to basically open sewers running down the street. And rationality gives us the Internet and everything else. And so... It's just unfortunate that if he does say, basically, oh, I don't, basically, just the answer is to run away and go to the woods, then he's not only ceding um, all of the, uh, his position within all of the sort of social circles, he's also ceding, you know, advanced sewage systems and, and, you know, food hygiene and dentistry and, uh, you know, aeronautics and all of these other things which rationality has given us. And he's leaving those to um, the bad guys, too. Well, yeah, and I think uh, since I've been sort of tuned on, turned on to gender, part of me has, has also thought uh, something as simple as menstruation might make you a little less likely to want to go and live in the woods, which she didn't suffer from, or at least have, have uh, the experience of. Yeah, and, and I think that there's definitely, like, the people who are aware enough, like like us, for example, and Thoreau, I think, to see how... Um, messed up all the problems of society they're they're definitely like we're action from people like us is necessary for progress like that's the first i mean i think that's what you were saying Steph. but that's what my mind translated it to for me i don't think it's even that the uh, the argument wouldn't be we are necessary for progress it would just be that like if thoreau is making a book about what he sees as virtue, which I think he is, because, I mean, he does talk about virtue um, directly in the book as well, then what the bit that that I got from what you were saying, Steph, is that the kind of thing that's not quite pointed out is that actually there is something that is kind of cowardice in terms of, of his approach to the the social ills of the world, because if, if everyone did just run off into the woods, then we'd be screwed. Well, and, and I don't mind people who don't want to fight. I mean, the fight is not for everyone. This is the theme of my book on agnosticism. If you don't want to have conflict with religious people and attempt to wrestle 
tender minds from their evil clutches, that's fine. Then, then, then don't fight. If you don't want to fight, if you don't have the stomach, if you don't have the guts, if you don't have the whatever, or you just want a more peaceful life, that's completely fine with me. Just don't try and turn it into a virtue. That's all I say. Mm. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not up there trying to solve blindness in the third world. I mean, there's a million things that I could be doing that would make the world a better place that I'm not doing. I just, I just don't make a virtue out of, out of not doing those things. Those are just not things that I'm doing right now or, or may ever do. I just, you know, I, 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 I'm not out there uh, uh, helping uh, African kids not get ringworm. I just don't make a virtue out of not helping African kids get ringworm, like out of not doing that. I think that's the only thing that if he were really comfortable with not fighting, then he would give it up. But I think he was torn to make the world a better place. He was terrified of the fights and the conflicts. And Lord knows I can understand that. I mean, in his, but, but then he slipped into the greatest trap of all, which is to make something you're afraid of a path of virtue. That's what I disagree with so much around Buddhism, you know, like they don't have conflicts. It's like, fuck, making the world a better place is a tough slog. I mean, people aren't going to give up union benefits without a fight. They're not going to give up status benefits without a fight. It just doesn't happen peacefully. Hell, uh, abusive parents aren't going to give up their adult abusive kids without a fight, as we all know. It, there is a fight, and if you don't want to have the fight, that's fine, but don't pretend that pacifism and non-engagement is any kind of virtue. That's the Eastern philosophy, and that's where I think Walden felt. Absolutely, because if he hadn't felt the need to make a virtue out of it, then there wouldn't be a book called Walden. It would just been some guy called Thoreau who went off into the woods and enjoyed himself, because he basically would have just... The, that, that would have just been his life choice, you know? It wouldn't be... Well, book. but it, it, sorry, it could have been. There could have been, a, I think, a much more powerful book which is to say I find the irrationality and evils of the world overwhelming. Uh, I don't have the stomach or the strength to fight it, and so I'm going to go and withdraw, and this is uh, my approach to these problems. Uh, I, I recognize that it's not an ideal solution. It's certainly not universally applicable. I hope that other people have greater strength than I do. Um, I think that would have been an incredibly honest and valuable book to have written, but that's not the book that was written. Right, right. It just seems to me like a big, a big self-justification for not taking on the immoralities of the world around him. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And there were people who were as well, because there were people out there, you know, making the moral case against slavery, and there were people... Like, however misguided some of his ideas might have been, there were people like Lazander Spooner who were doing all sorts of crazy things, like trying to show the immorality of the Postal Service by setting a different one up. And so there were people actively engaged at the same time as him. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, of course, the mail system, while more primitive than what we have, would have allowed them all to stay in contact. So there were lots of people out there doing the kind of stuff that he was not able to do. And, again, I, I think, to me, it is a perfectly honorable choice to say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. It's too much for me. It's too scary for me. I think we've all felt that at times, and I, I completely understand that, and I have no issues with it whatsoever. But uh, I think that if people say it to themselves that clearly, it's really tough to do what he did. And I think that's why there was a lot of fucking around the ethics of, of what he did and the virtue of what he did, and that he's you know, seeking peace and, and reconciliation and so on. Like, I remember this guy who was around a couple of years ago on FDR who wanted to uh, he, he was like a really great mediator, he thought, you know, how you could solve anybody's conflicts uh, with sort of non-aggressive communication. And uh, those people just annoy me uh, because it's like you can't solve every problem because there are win-lose situations in the world where uh, there, there is, you know, somebody gets messed up and somebody benefits, you know, like a muggy. Uh, those are win-lose situations. Morality, if it is universalized, it's going to be incredibly beneficial to the next generation and incredibly harmful to the last generation. Uh, there's no question. I mean, just look at something like Social Security. I mean, if it gets universalized in the non-aggression principle, the people who paid into the system or who had money stolen them from the system will have to ask for charity rather than get money from the state. Do you think they want to do that? Of course not. Of course not. That is terrifying to, to the elderly, and I can completely understand why. But it is a win-lose situation, and that unfortunately is the long-term effects of statism and religiosity and abuse, that it makes everything win loose. And that is uh, the reality, that if you have to change things, there are going to be people who are really going to get the short end of the stick, and they're not going to be very pleasant about it. I just 
that that is the empirical reality of the world. And the people who are like, oh, it's just, you know, big hugs and we can all get along, I think are just missing out the amount of violent resource allocation or propagandistic resource allocation that goes on in the realm of statism and religion. I mean, how's the Pope going to feel about atheism? It's a win-lose situation. And uh, that, that, I think, is, is a tougher thing. It's tough for people to, uh, to, to get the hang of, I think. Absolutely. I think that's a great point, Stan. All right, but thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is getting... Oh, no, no, don't grab the wolf. This is getting a bit rambunctious. We're going to head outside. But thank you so much for the chat. Uh, have yourself a great day, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Stan. Yeah. Cheers. Bye, Stan. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Have a good, have a lovely Sunday ahead and uh, look forward to chatting to you soon. Yeah, good night. Bye. Bye.